came in learning how to draw, learning the basics of painting, even, even taking anatomy courses. I mean, you know, many of us, we all took anatomy courses when I was in school anyway. And, and, and you built on it. And you, when you approached abstraction, you approached it differently because that was just a, a, a sense of not repetition, but a way of moving into another dimension, of getting another experience. You know, I use the word abstraction again. I, I just like because I, I just like the sense of what is good pain, what is it? Well, it's an abstraction. I would. I just make a little yeah, comment because I, I, I'm not really part of this discussion, but you bring up something that I've always thought about with uh, abstract painting. To me, um, usually I see what I think of as a good abstract painting is by someone who has that background that you're talking about, and you can tell that they actually can do whatever they want, and this is what they're choosing to do, as opposed to uh, the person who has no background, no real uh, knowledge, and, um, and hasn't done all this other work, and they are just like splashing paint on it. And you can tell. To me, you can tell. And that would be, for me, the difference between yeah. good and bad abstract painting. Of course, it's all subjective right, no matter right. what, ultimately. But, yeah. but, and that's sort of what I'm getting that you're sort of saying, because that's how I've always Right. Seen. I would like to add one, one point. It doesn't, it doesn't address directly the question of good and bad. And when I wrote the question, I realized that it's really not a fair question, because this is a, no, it's not. This, is, okay. this is a, this is a, a category where we try, actually try and avoid those kinds of value judgments. We do. But even though we try and avoid it, we're prone to it. So we say, oh, look at this, you know, this is, has no content, it's not, it hasn't got a commitment. But what I would like to point out that is important to me is that there is, at the present time, a tremendous amount of abstract, big abstract painting being done in the United States. I mean, an enormous amount. And I invite, and I really recommend everyone Get a current copy of Architectural Digest and look at it from one end to the other and make a note of how many interiors feature large abstract work. Almost every single spread and every single interior will feature large abstract painting. It's in vogue, it's fashionable, it's part of contemporary interior decoration, it's important, there's a big market for it, and it's sold like crazy. Now, what I'd like you to compare that, the paintings being done like that, compare that to the very first abstract paintings which were done in about 1947, 1945, by people like Jackson Pollock and Franz Klein, who, when they first put, it, put them up for exhibit, received scorn, absolute scorn and contempt. They lived through that, and interestingly enough, half a dozen of them killed themselves. It was a well-known part of their history. These people killed themselves out of their desperate frustration to make American art, in other words, a new American art. Whereas any day, thousands of new American art in the form of interior decoration are being created, sold, and put into houses. And this may be off the wall to make this comparison, but if you had a cousin who said to you, I'm gay and I just came out, and you'd say to them, well, congratulations. But it would be different if you were gay and you came out and it was 1947. If you came out in 1947, that would be an entirely different kind of statement because you would be, perhaps, knowingly risking your life instead of having everybody pat you on the back. And that's what abstract painting is now like, unfortunately, right now. There's so much of it that it's all good. Every bit of it is good. If you're looking for a beige texture to go in a white beige room. <laughs> right? But if you're looking for something that makes a statement about a person's life, it's nowhere to be found. But it is. It is there. It is there to be found. And there's, so to speak, specialists out there who 
job is to like point us in the direction of that, but there's also the simple re re response that we have when we walk, when we look at a thing and we say, oh, I feel something from this, you know? So that's my, uh, uh, I'm really antagonistic to contemporary, mass-produced, abstract interior design. I'm envious of it, and I wish I could do it. I want to ask to take into consideration one is, do you believe in the actual concept of greatness, other than your opinion? You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> your opinion, you got to the ego. Does it actually exist? And the other thing is this, because it's they're combined. There's only one test of greatness, and that's the test of time. Stuff that stinks will sink like a stone, and the other stuff will raise up to the top like cream. My memory stinks, but uh, uh, I have to preface that. But I think it was the Google Man, and I saw the show. And the concept of the show, Richard, was the most famous artists in the world at the end of the century. That's what they did in 2000, okay? All the same, I mean, the, and there were maybe 40 or 50 artists in the show. Of the most famous, they selected carefully the single most successful paintings in the world. A hundred years later, it didn't hear of 90% of them. They sunk like a stone. And they sunk because they deserved to. And the great ones, you know every single one of them. And that's what's going to happen now. If we talk about what's current now, a hundred years from now, I'm telling you, the stuff that's no good is going to swirl right down into the depths of hell. You know. Illustrate that by books of histories of museums. So in other words, if you look at the history of the Metropolitan, the first couple chapters will be about what was the collection like when it first opened. I don't know when the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York opened, but um, I imagine it was probably turn of the century, 1900s, maybe 1910, 1890, somewhere in there from the architecture. The entire place was devoted to paintings which um, we find embarrassing to look at now in our own storage. But, but that's right. Museums have storage of, of paintings that they bought, you know, 10 years ago or 50 years ago, and they said, how the hell did you buy this? And, and it's hidden in the, in the, in the bowels of the museum. Well, I, I think individuals do that as yeah. well. Well, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, look at it in this concept. When Rembrandt painted, basically everybody painted like Rembrandt. I mean, that was the style. Why is he still there and the other 99% of you he never heard of again? So what did he have that made it great? That's the question. Yeah. Soul. Yeah. Honesty. Truth. Not just technique. It has to go beyond that. Okay. About, you know, what do you like more, an abstract of Mondrian or uh, Jackson Pollock? If, if, if I remember correctly, you know yeah. the two names. Yeah. Yeah, in a way they're apples and oranges, but they're both, they can be both so great, but you, you do have to see them in person. I mean, if you go to the Museum of Modern Art and look at Mondrian, it's called Boogie Woogie. And the name is so great, that, you know, you can't forget yeah. it. But if you look at it closely, it's painted as thickly as a Van Gogh. It's just flat, so it's a different texture. But when I look at it closely, the paint's that thick. And that gave it a body and a beauty. And then the, the Jackson Pollock you're talking about, he painted those half crazed on the floor doing this stuff, you know? So it, it came from uh, a, a, a different source, you know? One was from the gut, totally. And the other one was poetry from the brain. Yeah. Um, do you each feel as though you have more or less of an appreciation for what we're talking about as abstract art. Uh, yeah, more or less of an appreciation from when you were younger painters to now. Um, <clears throat> or do you feel the same as if you No, no, you sure. I think. I, think, I hope we all do. You know, I, you mature, you sure your experience comes in. Well, I mean, did, did maybe you, uh, any of you think it, not much of abstract painting when it was new or new-ish, um, and you understand it better now, or did you always think it was great, or, or you still not really like it? Because now we're, we're talking about specific uh, types of abstract art, not so much about, say, the art of 
a, a great artist, but of say these famous artists, the ones that, that you know you're saying are the cream of the crop, the people we're still talking yeah. about, the ones right. whose names. I'd like to say something about this. I grew up in Utica, New York, which never has had an art gallery in its whole history met now. But it has, unusually, built in 1962, a Museum of Contemporary Art, which is the first of its kind, I think, as far as I know, people must consider the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. To have a little mill town have a museum dedicated to contemporary art was unusual. It opened when I was in high school. The collection is the permanent collection. When they opened in 1962, they bought a very expensive Rothko. They bought an expensive Picasso. Uh, uh, they bought an expensive um, um, Pollock. They bought, uh, by that I mean big signature work, an important work. They bought a very excellent Mondrian. They hung them up, and they have been hanging there since I was 18. And every time I go back to visit my hometown, which I did this last weekend, I go there and I look at those paintings over again. So I've been doing it all of my adult life. And every time, in one way or another, these pictures cause problems for me. I remember being 17 and thinking to myself, if Pollock is a good painter, then Mondrian must be a bad painter. Because <laughs> Pollock throws all his paint on canvas and he couldn't control where it lands. And Mondrian obviously paints these pictures with a ruler and a pencil and fills in a space very carefully. That's a different temperament. All right, so now I really have come to realize that it isn't like that, all right? But still, for me, it is because a person has to make a choice how they want to work. They want to work. Are you going to approach a painting from, I'm going to throw paint in your own way onto the surface Bush it around with a sponge, uh, um, put a rag on and pull it off and get an odd texture and think what that's going to do? Or do I want to start with a pencil and a ruler and draw shapes and literally color them in? These, all my life I've been faced with these puzzling questions. Now, about these three paintings, it's not just that I've looked at them my whole life. I've come to realize that yes, they 